Archaeologists believe that Paleo-Indians first left their footprints in the Upper Delaware Valley some 10 to 12,000 years ago. Climate was much different then. Winters were colder and lasted longer. There were no hardwood forests either, and the land was covered with tundra grasses and scattered spruce and fir forests. The Paleo-Indian was nomadic and believed to have arrived in North America over a land bridge between what is now Alaska and eastern Russia. What attracted these primitive people to the region was an abundance of wild game and fish. One of the things that they um, left behind, of course, were projectile points, and particularly uh, you have the, uh, and we have in our collection here, Clovis points. These were very early uh, points that were used by people uh, that lived here to hunt larger animals. Paleo-Indians preceded the Lenape tribe, who became permanent residents of the area approximately 5,000 years ago. As the regional climate began to more closely resemble that of today, early Native Americans spent their time hunting and fishing in the valley and traveling or farming the river in dugout canoes. Well, they would um, use nets. They could use large nets that would uh, go across an entire uh, channel of a river. They also used um, smaller nets and that's where you have the net sinkers would be used on the smaller nets and those are something that you would uh, find in this area. Uh, we found uh, milling stones that uh, were used by Native Americans for, for grinding uh, whatever kinds of uh, grain that, that they would have been uh, working on at the time. In time, other Native American tribes joined the Lenape in the Delaware Valley including the Iroquois and for a brief period, the Shawnee. Although conflicts between tribes occurred from time to time, for a millennium, man and river coexisted in unintrusive harmony. The beginning of the end of that harmony began in 1609 when Henry Hudson discovered both the Delaware River and its bay. Before long, white settlers began moving into the valley. The river was named as we know it today by Dutch colonists for Lord de Loire, the first governor of Virginia. Over the next 100 years, settlements like Fort Delaware, here in Narrowsburg, New York, began to spring up all along the river. Uh, generally speaking, the more settlers that came into the area, the more white settlers, uh, that increased the conflicts between the settlers and the Native Americans. So the more settlers there were, the more conflicts there were. I think the relationship varied uh, depending on what was going on at the time, from being cordial to um, uneasy, suspicious, to openly hostile. But for a time, the newcomers to the valley were content to either farm the fertile floodplain or fish and hunt the area, taking advantage of the large population of deer and wild turkey. But soon, a more commercial use of the river was realized. Along with trade, tanning and acid factories became important facets of the River Valley economy, as did the annual ice harvests. In the 1700s, timber harvested along the Upper Delaware Valley Corridor started being floated downriver to shipyards and industries in developing cities like Trenton and Philadelphia. Each spring, loggers would float large rafts of lashed timber south on high, fast water. But a rival for the river as a commercial highway was about to come on the scene. In the 1920s, the D&H Canal started operations by which canal boats, loaded mostly with Pennsylvania coal and slabs of bluestone destined for New York City and points beyond, were pulled by mules along towpaths on the Lackawaxen River until they reached the junction of the Delaware, and then ferried across by ropes. In the cross traffic, loggers and canalers often tangled, exchanging curses, blows, and eventually gunfire. 
an ingenious engineering solution to that problem came about in 1847 when John Roebling, the same John Roebling who later went on to design the Brooklyn Bridge, built a series of four suspension aqueducts. These elevated canals permitted canal boats to pass above the river and thereby avoid the rafts. Roebling's aqueducts were so successful that they remained in service 50 years until the railroad replaced boats and rafts as the main mode of transporting raw goods and materials downriver. The last surviving aqueduct was acquired by the National Park Service in 1980 and remains in use today as a vehicular bridge between New York and Pennsylvania. By the early 1900s, railroads all but brought an end to commercial traffic along the Upper Delaware River. When we come back, we'll look at the birth of a thriving tourist industry that continues right into this century.